everybody. Thank you for sticking with us for this long. Uh, Dan, I won't really steal your dongle. It's okay. Um, uh, so annotation as a curation tool is something that um, the folks up here know a lot about. Um, I think some of the folks in the audience also know uh, a lot about curation um, and uh, how one might actually use annotation um, as a tool for curation. But I wanted to give you guys just kind of an idea for, for there's a lot of people in the audience that are journalists and so um, unlike the curators who have all consumed news, um, you guys may not have really understood what curation uh, is and what curators do, and no, we're, we don't all work at the, in the Smithsonian. Um, so scientific data curation and scientific curation in general um, involves reading a lot of papers, so there's a lot of text. Uh, we read and extract a lot of this information. We add metadata to make it easier to actually find that information later. And um, we kind of do the extraction from data to knowledge in a lot of the cases. So essentially, it's a way to answer your scientific data question in a different way. And I've put up here just a couple of different kinds of questions. The green one would be the easiest one to answer. The, the dark red would be kind of the hardest one to answer, just as a scale to kind of show you the kinds of questions that scientific data curators might actually address. And there are databases um, that actually address all of these questions um, that were put together by a lot of curators. So for example, what is the concentration of a drug that I could use to knock out the function of my receptor? This is something that all scientists have to do at some point if they're doing any pharmacology whatsoever. They want to figure out how much of you know drug X do I inject in order to get an effect. And um, so that it usually involves just reading maybe six, seven, 10, 15 papers, um, writing down what numbers each person is using and in what kind of context. And if you know that there is something called a KI database, um, where those affinities uh, between drugs and, and proteins are actually listed and extracted out, then this process would take a lot less time for most people, and if they don't know that, then they have to read 15 papers. Um, which genes are expressed in the diseased kidney of a mouse? That would be a really uh, a harder question to answer. That would be probably a good chunk of your thesis, right? And then how many proteins might interact with my favorite protein? Again, that's many theses right there. Because what you're, what you're asking for is you're asking for broader and broader questions in order to actually try to answer those. Some of that information will be locked inside of many papers, and some of that information might be locked inside of different data sets. So um, curation actually brings a lot of this information together. Sometimes there are 30 curators, sometimes there are two. And all of that information becomes kind of a tabular version of, of itself. And so you can actually sort and ask the, these kinds of questions much more easily. So that's what we do as curators in, in biomedicine. And again, to kind of, again, demonstrate this process in a way that most people have interacted with information and data. What we do is uh, there's a manual curation process, much like our laundry pile here. Um, can be organized, right? And then there is something called semantic mapping, and that's just a really fancy word for labeling shirts and socks, right? And um, then there's, uh, we also talk about uh, automated indexing and things like that, and so what that means is we can tell how many socks we have. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah? Um, okay, and then there's resource identification, which then you just put a little barcode on each of your, your items that you want to identify. Okay, so what do we run into as a problem as curators? So the number of documents is staggering. Biomedicine is now about 26 million documents, and that's only in PubMed. Um, access to those documents is a problem for, as, a, as a human versus as a, um, as a uh, machine also. Content styles differ here and there. And document locations and the lack of resolvability between different uh, versions of the same document. Some publishers are really good at being able to do this, some are not. So these are all problems that we run into um, in terms of all of this. And some of these problems 
can be addressed if we use annotation. So the question to this panel is can annotation actually provide a bridge between the raw content and the scientific curation workflow? And so without further ado, I would love to bring uh, Courtney and she will tell us all about the ClinGen use case. Thank you, Anita. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Courtney Thaxon. I'm a senior bio curator with the Clinical Genome Resource. Um, I also happen to be their software development liaison between the University of North Carolina, where my PI, Jonathan Berg, part of ClinGen is. And I'm happy to say to hear someone, Martin, thank you for lumping and splitting. I'm also the chair of our lumping and splitting working group, which works on disease nomenclature or nosology. So what is the clinical genome research? Um, we are aimed at being, we're a large consortium that is aimed at making a authoritative resource um, for precision medicine and genomics. And so we have three main questions that we want to ask. We want to know whether or not a gene is associated with disease, which is a clinical validity um, score. We also want to know if variants within a gene are pathogenic or disease causing and give different grades of that. We also want to know if this information is actionable. And so what we want to say is that um, start, it did start in uh, 2013, we've been five years, and we have over 570 people from 230 um, different institutions worldwide. This makes up experts in the clinical field, bio curators, as well as volunteer efforts. And so Anita already gave a very nice overview of biocuration, but I do want to um, mention that for ClinGen, this does include evaluating scientific and biological data, and that pertains to a gene's involvement in, in disease. Um, so oftentimes as biocurators, we're looking at scientific articles through PubMed as we had gone through. Um, also uh, model organism databases. We do need to evaluate some experimental evidence, so this would include going out to outside sources um, besides articles, as well as clinical data databases that have pertinent patient information and phenotyping. And so not to go into too much of the nitty gritty, we did um, develop a semi-quantitative metric for us to actually give scores and classifications of a gene's association with disease. So as the biocurators, we do need to look and involve in the genetic evidence, which is going to be that patient data. We also need to look at the experimental level. This is going to be how this gene is expressed in different tissues, model organisms, rescue, and functional assays, um, as well as that protein product of the gene. Um, then what we do is we tabulate all of these scores per expert, um, expert opinion and give a classification for the gene and the disease. And so this all has to be entered into our gene curation interface or a database that we have. Um, this is just one example of how we have to go through. We need to enter a PMID, which you all may be familiar with now as a PubMed ID, um, within the article and then give all of the information that we have curated in order to log and base our scores for that. So we started to think that most of our curators were already using some form of annotation, but basically this was using a PDF and highlighting and or using a comment box, which is very inefficient. Or we just had to go and read articles and start typing things into our interface. Um, unfortunately, a lot of databases are just not very interactive at this point, and so it was a lot of time spent. But Matt Wright, who's one of the biocurators within Stanford and ClinGen, had told us about Hypothesis last year and how there was this annotation-based tool. So we really wanted to see if we had a more high-throughput systematic form of web-based annotation that was available, could this really help streamline our curation process? So um, one of the things we did, being that I'm a scientist and I'm trying to prove to scientists that something will work, I decided to do an experiment. Um, so I don't know if this will work in journalism, but I know it was one question, how do you get people to actually take up this thing, uh, give them numbers, which is I'm about to show you. Um, so what we really wanted to do was just beta test hypothesis to determine its usability, advantages, and disadvantages for biocuration. One of the ways that we implemented this was starting with our undergraduates um, that we had volunteering and giving them hypothesis and coming up and having them actually annotate um, and us coming back to teach them. We also did develop an SOP or standard operating procedure. This coordinates with our ClinGen gene disease curation process as well as our entry fields within our GCI. And so it effectively organizes the data that we need into the annotations, and I'll show you a sample of that later. And then really the key part was just to test whether or not this annotation tool that um, is provided by Hypothesis could really expedite and or enhance our curation process. 
So I'm not going to go over this in too much details, but just want to point out we did choose six different gene disease pairs. We picked them out of different working groups. This was important because as a curator, if you're staying on one specific disease topic, you start to learn it very quickly, as well as the gene, you understand it. And so if we changed between these, we would not um, be biasing ourselves to um, having ex expedited time. So we did want to vary that. We also did variables as well as an inheritance pattern because of the way you actually have to score that. Um, and so we did um, normalize, though, to make sure that myself and the other curator who participated in this were doing these same papers. Obviously, if we were using a different set of papers, then the time can vary based on the information that was within them. And so just to be able to go through, um, it was me and one other person, and so we are skilled match bio curators. Um, but obviously, if I did it in one method and then a second, I would learn as well. So to reduce that experimental learning, um, we went through and alternated. We also alternated between a demo and production version, so we would be a semi-blended manner for our experiment. Um, what this means is that uh, she would not know what any of my annotations were, I would not know what hers were. And so again, this was a way to normalize to time so that we weren't expediting or having any experimental um, changes introduced. And so just to go over the slight method, what would be our control curation method or method that we typically do is that we'd read this article in full. We would enter in this um, log our time. We would then go through our gene curation interface. Um, we would enter in the information, log that time as well. And then we would save these evidence summaries we have just so we can compare the amount of evidence we had that could have varied um, as well as what our time was. For the hypothesis, we would simultaneously read and annotate. Um, that was the beauty of that annotation, was being able to do that as you read and understood the article. Log those times. Um, we would follow that standardized SOP for tagging, and as well as um, entering the information into the GCI. And so this is just part of the um, hypothesis, our SOP. So um, the main thing to point out here is that we gave some primary and some secondary tagging for us to be able to relay the information back up on the dashboard. Um, this would include tagging with ClinGen, the gene of interest, as well as the disease. And then because we have certain information we need to enter into our gene curation interface, I basically had inner annotations or page notes in which were highlighted to tell us the information that we needed for that entering. And so again, we would just log the time for that and calculate it. So here are the results of that that I'm going to show you now. On the left-hand side, you can see this is our total gene curation time. So in our control method, or our typical method, we averaged about four hours um, to curate each one of these gene disease pairs. Um, but when we used hypothesis, we actually saved about 35 minutes per um, gene disease association there. Um, and it may not seem that significant. Um, it wasn't at this point, but that still is a significant amount of time. When I start to pull out the information that we had, if I looked at just the annotation and reading time as expected, we would have expended more time using hypothesis because we were reading and annotating versus just reading the article. But honestly, when you're curating, this is where you want to spend the most of your time. You want to understand and read the article. This is the most important. Um, our major time savings was obviously into our gene um, entry into the gene curation interface, which was beautiful because I don't want to spend my time in the interface trying to figure out what question it asks me and understanding where it is in the paper. So that was a significant amount of time that was saved. Um, I was actually quite amazed on some parts where it would have taken us about 30 minutes to enter in our interface. It went down to two minutes of entering the information. And so this is just to show you how it's coordinated. Um, here we have just our first part where we would highlight the title of the article. We need the PMID to associate it as well as a gene disease pair. Um, we happen to have a specific ontology ID for that disease. But you can see it coordinates perfectly with our entry into our gene curation interface. This is the first um, type of information we need to curate and enter to even score information. And so it's just beautifully um, coordinated with that, which it allowed me to copy and paste right Right into there. The same would be true of any of our case results. Um, the way that I designed and laid this out is that we could just easily go and copy and paste the information in and save it. 
And so if I wanted to go even further besides just looking at um, the total time per curation, this would be if I took each article that we curated, which was about six on average over six um, different gene disease pairs, so 36 articles, we found that the total time savings was about six minutes per article. Um, so that becomes very significant when you're talking about having to curate 23,000 genes for diseases um, in the future, which is our ultimate goal as ClinGen. Also, we found if I want to go down even further, um, each paper could have a different amount of curatable evidence, as we've called it. If I have a specific clinical paper that has 10 patients in it, that would be 10 curatable units. Um, if I have one paper on an animal model, that would be one curatable unit out of a paper. So if I went and divided those up, I could see again that we had a significant amount of time. On average, about five minutes we saved. And again, that's similar to that total article time because of the fact that there are different amounts of curatable units per paper that we have. But the great part is, is if I wanted to pull out a paired statistics or a two-way ANOVA, we can see that over the entire six gene disease relationships that we, we saved a significant amount of time using annotation, which was um, fantastic. I do want to point out, though, that there was one outlier. Um, if you look at our original um, total time that I showed you, you can see that the one that was for retinoblastoma 1, the gene, we actually expended more time in hypothesis than we did on our control. Um, I have to say that was because um, what happened is, is uh, literature can be very hard in reading through it, and so this is an autosomal recessive disease, which means you have to have two mutations, one on each allele that you've inherited from your mother and father. And unfortunately, the paper that had gone through, the curator started with, made it seem like they were autosomal recessive for the same mutation. And it wasn't until very in, uh, in the late in the paper in the discussion that they actually said, we don't know what the other mutation is, which means the whole entire evidence was not curatable because we need to know what both of those mutations are to count it. So this is another good point. Always read through your entire article <laughs> because there could be really important information right at the end. Um, so I think that preemptively, when we had the notes from that made the curator very cautious now in going through the rest of these. But if we take that one outlier out, we could see that we could save up to 8.4 minutes per article. So the conclusions of this is that we did find that annotation did expedite the curation process for our gene curation. We also found that annotation redirected the curation to spend more time on the article and less time in the GCI entry, which is exactly what we would want to happen. We also know that annotation allowed for an unrestricted curation. This was also the beauty. Within our GCI, both me and my fellow curator, Jen McGlon, um, knew that we would have to set aside about four hours of time during our day to be able to complete a gene curation into our GCI just because we were restricted by having to have certain specified fields filled in before we could save the information. But with hypothesis, we could come and go as we wanted, read an article, read part of an article, annotate, and come back to it whenever we wanted to do that, which was really great for our schedules. Um, and so this also uh, reduced our biocurator frustration, I have to say. And I just want to just uh, show you and um, make you a kind of consider this real-time projection of using this. And so uh, this is a group of curations that I performed um, specifically in our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy group. Um, you can see that there were 15 gene relationships that I did. Um, and then you can see that I had a total of about 159 papers that I curated just for these 15 um, genes. That averaged about 10 articles per paper. So if we go through our time savings of about um, six minutes per article, that means that if I would have used hypothesis in the beginning, I could have saved 15.37 hours of work, which could have equated to an additional 27 articles read for this specific group. That would have meant two more gene disease um, curations that I could have performed, and other ones where they only take six. That's a significant improvement on my workflow. And so the future directions I just want to point out is that we're looking to scale up our curation efforts using hypothesis throughout ClinGen um, in our new working groups, both gene and our variant curation. Uh, we also do want to use it potentially as a platform for our community curations. This would be where we have volunteer um, curators that want to come in either from clinical diagnostic labs or just anyone in the community who wanted to contribute to ClinGen, that we thought this was a perfect way for them to get acquainted with our SOP, put the 
information down but not have to digest the 65 SOP that we have for our typical standard operating procedure as well as clogging down our gene curation interface. This would allow for senior biocurators to go validate that information before entering it in as well. And just enter, um, uh, potentially looking at integrating it with the ClinGen gene curation interface. Um, if there's a way now that we can take these structured annotations that are um, linked back to specific uh, entry sites into our GCI, could we actually have it pre-populate these annotations within a database, which would be even some more significant time savings. We also think that this is a great way for us to use as a platform for training new curators. Um, this is a way that we can have our biocuration evidence and evidence capture of that. Um, and we are tr currently training undergraduates, um, as I had mentioned. And it does allow for a real-time feedback. As you can see here, I was working with one of our undergraduates who was asking me a question about a specific curation, and I was responding to her um, at any time of day that I had on what I felt the answer was to her question. Um, so it's been a very great resource for us to do training um, at any time with individuals. So I'd just like to thank you all. Um, um, thank my uh, fellow curator, Jim McGuan at UNC, um, my supervisor, Jenny Goldstein and Jonathan Berg, as well as hypothesis, John Udell um, has been very great. Maryam Martone helped us um, go over this, and we are funded through the NIH. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm from the Ohio State University. Um, I'm a software architecture from the Department of Bio Biomedical Informatics. Uh, so last year, uh, our department adopted a, a tool from uh, uh, Dr. Richard uh, Boyce uh, for an annotation press tool. We use that for the drug interaction, which is used by our students for the internship now uh, in the Ohio State University. So it's a tool to uh, annotate all the drug interaction within some publication, what we have in our database. Um, it's, uh, the project is, uh, is originally funded by Richard, uh, Dr. Richard Boyce. Uh, it's been, I think it's starting from uh, 2015. Uh, the overview of the project uh, today we have is the user cases and the motivation to, for the new annotation tool and what annotation press can do and uh, what are the technical details for these projects. Mm. For the user cases, we have the evidence synthesis for drug interaction uh, decision support, which is used by the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh. And um, uh, in the Ohio State University, we have a drug uh, DDI toxicity annotation plugin, which we call drug interaction uh, within the publication, which is supported by the um, clinical trials. Uh, the long term for this project is that so we want to, we want to be able to annotate at the time of the publishing the uh, the publications. So we want to share the annotation we have with the other colleagues or maybe the professors. Uh, the, pro, uh, the concept uh, for the drug interaction, uh, we have a, a lot of drug uh, publication. We want to be able to annotate that and share that with the students, uh, even for the further uh, reference. This is a, a proof of concept, uh, what the evidence can um, affect the decision from the medical side. The DDI toxicity annotation plugin for the annotation, pre, uh, for the annotation press at the Ohio State University. So we want to identify and check cancer uh, drug interaction and its toxicity data from the uh, corpus, what we have in our database. And our goal is to annotate 4,000 uh, articles which is published from 1975 to 2015. All those publications contain all the drug safety data. We want to annotate that and share that with all the uh, researchers communities. Uh, before we start developing this tool, we did um, investigate some uh, annotation tool in the market. Uh, most of them are not very useful for the um, medical publications. Because most of the publications from the uh, medical side, we it's in the PDF format, which is a great challenge for all the annotation tools. 
for this project, we use lots of modern, uh, modern web application architecture. So we use Node.js as both front end and uh, uh, front end and back end. And the database, we use uh, uh, Elastic Search, which is a JSON format based database. And we want to share that information with uh, uh, other institutions. We have some other project which is going on with Elastic Search for the dashboard between the different annotations. And we use PDF.js for the annotation in the PDF uh, publications. And it's all browser-based. There is no plugin installed on the even either Chrome or Safari, just uh, BS. And the uh, annotation can be extracted as a CSV format for the future editing. You know, sometimes annotation is not exactly the way uh, you want that, so we can extract that to the CSV, and we can add that later and share with the other institutions. Uh, for the demos, uh, I have two uh, videos. Is this connected to the internet? Yes. Just click on it, right? radio buttons to the left are displayed that can be checked for the appropriate drug. If the drugs inhibit or are a substrate of another item, then these radio buttons disappear and the second drop down menu appears in the middle for selecting the appropriate enzyme of this interaction. For this interaction, we will consider this to be a pair of drugs that interact with each other. Now, the method for this claim can be added. Since this sentence span includes data items, results, and precipitant information, the method will be considered as DDI clinical trial. Finally, with the annotated drugs included in the selected sentence span, a distinct drug 1 and drug 2 can be assigned to phenytoin and mirtazapine, respectively, through the drop-down menus. And we will consider phenytoin to be the precipitant for this interaction. This claim will be saved by clicking Save and Close. Once the claim is saved, another menu appears with a set of three options. Choosing the option for adding data from the same text band for claim initializes the data and material editor. The option for add another claim from the same text band keeps the existing claim that was just created and allows the user to create another claim based off another set of two distinct drugs from the same sentence band that was just used. Finally, the option for move to a different text span signals the annotator to finish with the annotation editor and brings the user back to the full annotation table. And uh, there's another demo which is used by the uh, Ohio State University. So the first demo is for, which created by Dr. Richard for the, uh, the drug uh, interaction DDI they are using on their uh, university. Um, for the time uh, limit, I think I'm gonna pass that uh, demo. If anyone is interested, uh, you can come to me and I will share that with you guys. Um, technical detail is pure JavaScript for the web application and uh, uh, Elastic Search for the backend uh, data storing and a relational database, uh, Postgre just for the uh, authentication and uh, uh, configuration. And it's all open source licensing. Uh, we do have some issue for this project. Um, when we want to share the annotation, we have some challenging um, so different user will create a different annotation. So sometimes when they're importing, which will not work perfectly when the other user log into the system. And exporting, we only support CSV format currently. 
for the from the development side, the electricity search we are using is very old. It's it's a 1.7 version. I think the, the latest version is a 5. And a VPM and a Node.js, it's very old as well. Uh, for this project, originally we want to uh, develop a platform which a user can easily develop some plugin based on what we have. But it turned out that uh, if you want to develop the plugin, you still need a lot of scale for the programming. Uh, we want to be easy to configure the system when, during the runtime, but now it's just uh, the configuration needs to happen before the deployment. Uh, the acknowledgement, so this is a fund from a National Library of Medicine, and so from the Ohio State University, it's a department-funded project by the uh, Biomedical Informatics. Uh, this is all the source we have. Uh, it's, the code is, is hosted on the GitHub, and there is a form for the D, um, for knowledge base, and the email is as follows. And now Tom will show us how annotations can be done by robots so that curators don't even have to be involved. Yes, so I'm really happy to be able to go after Courtney because we don't have any real data about what it was like before Hypothesis. Um, we only started with Hypothesis and what I'll show you is the next transition of when you go from human curation to machine and human curation. So first, I'm going to start with an introduction to what is the problem we're trying to solve here and what is this RRID thing. So if we see the highlighted text here, this describes some, um, in this case, mouse. Is this a mouse? Yeah. So this describes a mouse. I couldn't even tell it was a mouse from reading that. Um, and when you... People think it's a mouse. Yeah. From that? Yeah, it says mice, but it could be a mouse antibody. See? <laughs> the... Um, so you take that piece of text, you copy it in, you search in JAX, you search a number of places, and you don't find anything. Um, so what we did was we created uh, a workflow which basically said, let's not email the author as we have to do in this case. Instead, let's just put a number in. It's called the research resource identifier. Uh, and then we can click on that link and it'll take us exactly to the mouse that we use. We don't have to have any ambiguity. We don't have to send any emails. Um, and this led to a major increase from I think about what 50% of uh, resources cited in method sections were identifiable to now over 90% can be identified um, precisely. How did we, so how did we do this? When we started getting our IDs, we wanted to be able to compile all of the, the ones that had been used in the literature so we could find out for the NIH and for vendors, uh, are people using the tools you've funded? Are people using this antibody? What trouble are they having with it, et cetera? So the old workflow was essentially, one, find a paper by, by searching PubMed, Google Scholar, you name it. Um, then go to PubMed, get the PubMed ID, copy and paste it in to the Hypothesis client, remove the space, um, <clears throat> uh, and then right, that all goes in an annotation on the title because this started before there were page notes. Now they're page notes, so we can do a page note to everything. Um, and then you go to the Research Resource Identifier portal in times where n is equal to the number of RRIDs in the paper plus the number of resources that the author failed to identify completely. Uh, this took about 30 minutes per paper, and then you do it all over again. So at this point, we said to John, I do believe, this is really, really slow. Can we make it faster? All we're doing is a regex max match. So what is Cybot? Cybot is the punchline of the joke. Two REST APIs, a regular expression, and a bookmark walk into a bar, <laughs> and they find out that they're out of sync and insecure. Uh, so if you want usability uh, for the Hypothesis web client plus a bookmarklet, you have to figure out how to get SSL set up, and that's really the hardest thing that you're going to have to do. Um, and then you're going to have to make sure, because curators like to click buttons repeatedly, that if they click the button twice, you don't annotate the paper twice. Um, 
That's sort of the extent of the engineering that's needed to do this. It was all done in Python. And at the end of the day, Cybot runs its regular expression over the whole paper. Um, and that it goes and looks up the um, XML record in our systems for the RRID, pastes it into the paper, uh, and then the curators go through and look to see whether these are correct, whether it matches what's in the paper. So the improvement, so I told you that we had 30 minutes, so I'm only showing you things that are less than 30 minutes um, as sort of representative of cases where our curators had just one session to go through. And what we see is that the vast majority of our curation time is now under five minutes. So on average, we're under, the mean is about six minutes, and our, our median time per, like, curator time is three and a half minutes. Uh, so that's a, almost a tenfold uh, increase or decrease in, in time spent. Um, so the numbers for, for then, then the question is, well, how do, how, do, how do machines and humans work together? What does it look like? Who does most of the work? Um, well, the machine does most of the work. Um, Cybot has a total of 80,000 annotations, uh, 40,000 of which we have gone through the full curation process and made public. Those are available in the public group. If you search Cybot in the Hypothesis client right now, you will see all of those. Um, for the curators, they have about 30,000 annotations. So these are the cases where resources were missed or my regular expression failed, um, you name it. Uh, type, uh, publishers have weird typesetting uh, for a number of RRIDs and we've regularized that so those problems are improving. Um, but the real bulk of what the curators do uh, is they reply to Cybot annotations and they say, okay, that we verified that this is correct, um, we, um, this is junk, I don't know why you're annotating things that aren't even RRIDs, Tom, please fix your stuff. Um, and that's how we then take those tags and evaluate the quality of the annotations and we go through a full workflow Oftentimes, it will then go to somebody like Anita, who's our head curator, who can review all of those and provide feedback for your curator saying, hey, please go through and fix these, all done via the reply mechanism. Um, we've done this for about 10,000 papers total, and we've been running the system for about two years. Um, and the end result of the, the human versus the machine is that the machine is ahead by about 53%. Uh, we would like to get that up a little bit higher, but um, you know, undergrads are cheap and we do pay them. Um, so, <laughs> um, and then the breakdown is that if you look, any one individual curator, we usually keep them around for about a year, a year and a half, um, they will get to maybe 15,000 annotations over the course of their lifetime uh, with us, and they have, we have total unique art things that we have to identify um, are on the order of about 28,000 different things that we have identified in papers. I don't think there's any one curator who is gonna be able to remember all of those things um, or hunt them all down. If you had to take even 20 curators, um, that's gonna be an enormous amount of work just in terms of pure Googling time. Um, so th that's Cybot. It has, the, and it covers that transition. So when you get um, a hypothesis-based workflow and you can really identify, these are the things that I need to pull out, even if it's simple as a regular expression on something, you can get as much as you know, a tenfold increase in your ability to, to curate papers. And we, as I said, we would not have been able to even start this workflow without hypothesis. Uh, so we don't have any numbers on what this process would look like if we weren't using web annotation. So now I wanna jump ahead to slightly more complex things that you can do with uh, the annotation client. This was a project that I've been working on for my PhD, which involves curating the parameters and inputs and outputs out of method sections in scientific papers. 
And essentially, I just want to take this text and I want to convert it into some structured data. Uh, and I want it to look like this at the end of the day. Um, and the point is that I don't want to have to doubt whether I typed it in right. Uh, because recuration or a trans, uh, translation error, if I'm just reading a paper and typing, I, find, I have found them all the time um, with this system because I can go click on that hypothesis link, which takes me back to the fully annotated paper so I can see it in context. Um, and I have my curator go through, highlight everything she wants, and using just the raw client, pasting in all the links. So the other interfaces which people have been building, I would love to have. But for me, I said, you know what, I don't have time to do this. I just want to use the raw client. Let's see if we can build a workflow on it as a proof of concept. And we can. We can do it. Um, these are the kinds of things that web annotation, like the, the web annotation data model and the hypothesis client, um, all of that infrastructure is in place to let you essentially highlight sections of a paper and compile it into real code. Um, I didn't tell my curator that she was programming when she was doing this, but she was. Um, and uh, links to everything, I'm happy to, to demo this to anybody who's interested uh, at any point in time. So thank you very much. So I think we want to take some questions, and uh, there's a question in the audience. So you want to? So um, uh, DOI is a unique identifier of an object. So how come two of you are using PubMed IDs, which are secondary identifiers of an abstract derivation of that object. Let me take this one. <laughs> um, as a curator of many, 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 many biomedical databases, there, um, I think we've, we've got uh, 270 of them deeply integrated into uh, SciCrunch, and we have lists of about 27, 2800 now. Um, almost all of them use PubMed IDs because they're numerical, they're easy, um, and they are the standard for biomedicine. Now, I know that you don't have PubMed IDs. No, no, I'm not, I mean, there are things that don't have PubMed yeah. IDs, the set oh, is yeah. bigger, but the, my main, main problem is that, that the ID is, is an ID of an abstract in PubMed, it's not yeah. the identifier of the thing you're talking about, which is the article. Yeah, that's definitely a conflation of the thing versus a, a web page about the thing, and apparently no one cares. I, I can also answer and say that, in fact, in the Cybot client, um, that was the old workflow. The new workflow is that I have found as many different variants of the DOI markup tags for papers, and when they click on the Cybot uh, bookmarklet, it sends the, the HTML and the text version of that, and it pulls the DOI out. Now, DOIs aren't always in the, the meta tags. So in that case, we do still ask the, um, the curator to go to PubMed because it's at, the people who are compiling that mapping are in CBI. And in CBI, if you have the PMID, you can get the DOI. So that's in that second pass when we do the public release. I go get the, the DOIs for all of the papers that we have. It's just, I mean, because of things like cross-ref event data, it means that you can people will be able to use the DOI to be, be alerted, in theory, to the kinds of things that you're doing, which, I, no, no offense to NLM, but that will never happen with PubMed. Yeah, but there is one thing that we also have to point out. It, when you have a PubMed ID, it is extremely convenient and easy to just hit their services and grab all of the article metadata, which is exactly the same across all the journals that have, you know, that have been listed in PubMed. Um, it's an open, easy API, um, and so that's just, it's a factor of convenience. Do you read this book, The Selfish Gene, okay? And uh, also you read the chapter 11 on the Meme? On, 
on meme meme tricks. Yes. Okay. And what do you understand? Well, there is a theory now within the genes that gene names aren't stable. I do have to say that I have not read that book yet, but um, are, you, are you talking about nomenclature for genes? The answer there is that um, we, can, we can now, using annotation, measure genes as easily as we can measure memes. <laughs> in the sense that uh, if you want to be able to see how, um, how both the research on the genes and the genes themselves and all of these other things work together, the math and the structure ends up being quite similar. Um, this, is, uh, this one's uh, for Courtney. Um, curious uh, what what we can do to decrease the time, curation time even further? Well, right now I've been working with um, John Udell lately and uh, one of the most time consuming parts for us um, in our context is that we're always having to link out to other web pages to find our information. For instance, we do have to look up ontologies. Um, you all may all understand this, but within phenotypes, we have a human phenotyping ontology. Um, we go through potentially three different databases. They're not all exact or complete, um, but we've now created a workflow where potentially as we are annotating, we're going back to check looking up a name and it will pre-populate within our annotation. Um, so we're very excited about potentially having that ability where um, it's not me going back and typing things in, but by using the highlight function um, and capturing the name of that phenotype that it's now linked out to do a search um, for different sites and then pulling that information. So it's the fact, based on the fact check uh, function on journalism um, that we can just go and then I'm um, checking that yes, this is actually the HPO that I want and it will come back and populate. So um, I think cr trying to create some workflows like this would be great. Um, as well as um, we're talking about can we potentially now link those specific um, inner annotations that I've done where I've highlighted in the bold printing, this is where we need to capture information that's going to be entered in the GCI. If there's some way to be able to pull that data through API and then coordinate it with the GCI. So as I'm typing and annotating, it's also pre-populating in our database. I can also offer some insights into uh, some of the challenges I've had. Um, one, not just linking out to other sites, but also linking back into the annotation layer. Um, as you saw in my slide, I'm doing that by pasting links into the text box, but um, one of the real powers of the hypothesis client is that it gives you the spatial structure and if you can select um, another annotation that you want to have some relationship to, that, it, that would greatly decrease um, the amount of time that it takes to do that, that kind of workflow. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's probably the big one that I've observed. This, this is related, I think, to that question of Dan's and one of the last slides you had, Courtney. Um, you've now had your curator, as curator, you've annotated these pieces in order to speed the process for what you need to do. Um, but you also mentioned that there was the use of annotations to kind of get a little discourse going with undergrads. And are there other end users that would benefit from seeing your annotations, not just for search, but even for just understanding and maybe using them as a, lever, a, a starting point for, for discussion? Oh, um, most definitely. I think um, the goal in ClinGen in the end and with us having the website is that we are going to try to curate these 20, 23,000 genes associated with disease and we want it to be completely transparent so anyone can come to our website. And the beauty of Hypothesis is that eventually as we go through our process, um, we would want to make those public. And so that would... Um, initiate any kind of um, information, the author could potentially come back and write to us saying, I don't agree with your interpretation of this, and it can allow for discussion for us to reevaluate that gene and disease. It could also allow for other scientists to see the gaps um, that are missing within their gene or disease <coughs> realm. Um, oftentimes we have functional assays that just aren't appropriate. That would really help us for pathogenicity, a variance. Pathogenicity meaning it will cause disease. 
Um, this is a very big deficit in our variant curation, and so we feel like if we can eventually put these public, which is what we would want to do, um, that we can create a discussion within the whole environment, and it can allow for teaching of other um, individuals um, for what we're doing as ClinGen and how we evaluate um, each piece of evidence. We also have a use case for this, which is that we curate cell lines, and we have a number of contaminated cell lines. Um, and what we can do through the hypothesis client is we can actually go in and when we find that out, we update the public version with a, with a notice which says at the top, warning, this is contaminated. Um, and we can even add a tag so that you can pull out all of the contaminated cell lines and find out whether they're on your papers. <laughs> Um, so I worked on a uh, literature review, uh, mitophenome uh, literature review uh, database um, uh, comparing genes and uh, phenotypes you know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, is there anything that, say, people can use hypothesis when they're writing the paper so that you have this pre-tag stuff? I mean, I, I, I know the constraints here, but... Oh, most certainly. Um, you know, for us, especially in the clinical data, like I said, these human phenotyping ontologies would be great. Um, ClinGen's actually going to some of the journals not only for that, but to um, give the ClinVar IDs and the actual HDNC nomenclature for their variant. Um, so they're going to try to institute with journals that if someone's publishing on a specific variant that they do it, but annotating it would also be very helpful. We would have that information at hand, which we capture. Um, anything where you're giving out a phenotype instead of just having it in um, the phenotyping words or lay terms, actually having these codes and identifiers. Um, oftentimes you could have several different codes for the same thing, so having the clinicians already annotate that out would be um, brilliant. Okay, this is for uh, Tom and Courtney. Um, I was just wondering what the volume of work to be done is. So how many papers, Tom, have you, have you run through with, you said like 55,000 with, with Cybot, but um, how many more are there to do? And I guess it's the same question for you, Courtney. Sort of what's the, what's the human annotation workload that, that's there and how do we reduce it to make it manageable? I, I think I'll start by saying that um, the volume of papers that we do that currently have RRIDs, I think our coverage is well over 90% of those. Um, however, if RRIDs are adopted and used more widely, <laughs> uh, then, then we will have uh, a big challenge. So it will, be, it will no longer be a question of um, what's the total number? It'll be a question of how big is the pipe, um, and yeah. So we've we've actually done a lot of analysis for um, what our scale up needs to be, and um, that's why we've been really pushing on Cybot to make it better and in, improve the machine readability of sentences and add additional tools. Um, maybe we'll present that next year, um, but essentially. We are growing, the RRID usage is growing at about 300% per year, um, which at the moment, it's not that big, right? But if that continues, um, then 300% a year leads us to about 200,000 papers a year in the next couple of years. So within three to five years, we're going to be dealing with, you know, essentially the total set of the biomedical literature if this actually, you know, continues to grow at this rate. Um, which means that we will need either a large army of undergraduates, um, which are available at most universities, um, but uh, you know, really the machine learning tools are, are going to be, um, and, and an extension of Cybot is going to be uh, needing to do the lion's share of that work. So um, you know, depending on how fast this, this grows, it'll be really important for us to reduce, you know, the two minutes down to a, even a much lower time, right? For our question, um, so far we have about 1,500 gene disease pairs that are curated. Um, so out of 23,000, we have quite a ways to go. Um, that's not even including that each gene could have up 
from five to 500 variants that need to be curated um, for them once they are known to have a definitive classification. Those are the ones that we are starting with first for our variant curation. Um, so there's a long way to go with that in, in actionability, um, but uh, we do have um, a very large consortia effort. As you can see, 570 individuals. This is including experts, volunteers who are experts in curating the information. Um, but this is definitely a process that can help um, in trying to get that community curation and could very well help us as well. I was wondering, um, first of all, whether maybe like BioArchive is part of the intake in terms of encouraging the, the uptake of the identifier, but secondly, whether as part of the process of maybe creating a preprint or something, the actual authors could essentially be the curators. Um, let them you know, bundle the automated part of the analysis into the submission system, give them the results, and let them correct the errors. Funny you mention that. Guess what we were doing uh, with Richard yesterday. <laughs> but yeah, the, I, I think we'll have a lot more to report probably um, in the next year or two. Um, those things are ongoing. Okay, a round of applause for this panel.